Okay, so today, uh, with a very interesting bottom logo to our presentation, <laughs> we are going to kick off how to grow your own threat intelligence victory garden. Little known fact, uh, the CFP had in white text, all presentations must have a World War II theme. <laughs> Not sure how it was put in, but I think Rick slipped it in, so let's rock. Okay, before I go any further, I have some legal things. Rule of thumb, no longer allowed to do safe harbor since it kind of got nixed, so we still have to say, don't buy stock in any of the crap we're about to tell you. Um, Dave is a habitual liar, I can't get it out of him, so just go forward with that, but take ideas that were coming from this and go do it. We're not professional developers, we're not even professional anythings, but we do have a lot of fun, hope you guys do too. So, Ryan Kovar, I've been in the DoD kind of world doing cyber for a pretty long time. I've also worked in the UK, I've worked in Japan, various other places. Currently at Splunk for the last two and a half years on the security practice team where I get to build cool things and then talk about it in the security sphere. Hey guys, I'm, I'm Dave Harold. I uh, work with Ryan at Splunk. I've been there a couple years. Uh, we work on the security practice team. Um, I've been around in, in IT and security for about 20 years. Um, I'm pretty stoked to be here because I owe pretty much everything I've ever done in security to SANS. I'm, I'm a GSE, I've been through um, tons of classes and, and we're, we actually got to take the 578 class uh, this last week, which was fantastic. Woo! Um, Come on, yeah. let's hear it. Come on, some of you were in there. Yeah. There we go. There's, everybody in this room should be taking that class if you haven't. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of the plumber and Ryan's kind of the rock star. So if you needed to put us in buckets for the security uh, personas, so that's, uh, those, those are the, the, the hats rock that we star, wear. It's more of like a Ringo star. Yeah. But yeah. Anywho. So Dave and I have been around for a pretty long time. Uh, we've done a lot of things. We're not subject matter experts in very many. So what this means is we like to get shit done, right? We wanna go out there, we gotta find stuff, we wanna write stuff, we wanna put it in production. We're C&D guys who dabble in the world of threat intelligence. We take the things that many of you people in this room have created and built and then try to implement it, right? So as we go through this, you're gonna see a lot of, this is not rocket science, but it's all based on stuff that we've seen over the last 10, 15 years that everyone's talking about, but no one's put into kind of a cohesive narrative. So let's do an agenda. And first off, I'd like to call attention to the world's best agenda, which was with Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley. I don't think anyone is ever gonna get better than that single agenda, where the guy who dies of a drug overdose tries to become a federal law enforcement officer to prevent drug abuse. So after that, let's just set expectations lower. We're gonna talk about the things that you should be doing, because really it's just shit you should get done, right? We're gonna tell you how we think you can do it, we're gonna go view some code examples, but not too in-depth, just kind of high-level stuff, because we're not that smart. And then we're gonna give you a couple other things to take away. Because I think, personally, my belief is, anything you get from a talk, you should have something to take away and do immediately with. So let's go into a quick overview. All right, so, yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the concept of the talk, right, is, is the, the old victory gardens from World War II, where, where citizens were, were uh, encouraged, right, to grow food. Uh, grow their own, if you will. I'm from Colorado, so um, it has special meaning. Um, <laughs> um, but but you, there's actually a lot of data in your environment um, that you can take advantage of, and it's definitely not to discount the, the value you can get from all the great um, pay-for um, threat intel providers here. It's not a substitute for that. It's just saying, hey, you're actually leaving a lot of things on the table, as Ryan says, if, if you don't take advantage of these things. Um, and, you know, Obviously, this whole talk is more about doing things, um, and the things that we're suggesting are not new, right? Um, these are things that are suggested by folks like Rebecca and Rick in previous talks. Uh, uh, Rebecca had a, um, a presentation where she talked about 99 problems and budgets, one of them, right? But um, this is a screenshot from that, but it talks about um, how, do you, how do you actually take a lot of um, internal data and make it useful. Um, I think this is from Rick's last year presentation or previous presentation where he said, hey, look at internal enrichment sources. Um, and so we are, uh, <laughs> sorry, somebody's, it's not my Yeah, phone. we're going to kick him out later, yeah, Dave, don't that's worry. Right. This is the greatest talk I've ever seen. Who was uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep, so, um, so standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and here's the thing, Dave and I, I had 248 nights on the road last year. Dave hit well over 100. We travel a lot, and we travel everywhere. We're in Hong Kong, we're in Moscow, and that's it. Um, also all over the US, right? All over Europe, we deal with South America, we do everything but Antarctica, and I'm still waiting for that expense report to clear. 
And what we see dealing with from tier one all the way to tier three, the people who are literally writing the books and the coursework, <laughs> right? We find that people are having the same problems. They're still not actually leveraging internal threat intelligence sources. So what do we find? Sadness. A lot of sad pandas, right? Which we'll get into that later, I'm sure, within the week. But let's talk about why we need to do this. We need to do this talk because we want to evangelize, and it's a douchey term, but let's go with it, this idea of internal threat intelligence, right? Dig your own, dig deep into the data sources you have. We want you to stop after this presentation and really think about what you can get out of your own organization without paying a dime. Threat intelligence is awesome, I bought a lot of it. I give the recommendations all the time to people about what they should buy depending on their vertical, right? But imagine a world where you can get your own threat intelligence for free, just blisters on your hands. <laughs> All right. <laughs> on to you, Dave. All right, so let's, let's actually talk about something real. Um, first of all, so we work for Splunk, but we're not here to sell Splunk in any way. Everything that we're gonna talk about is, uh, can be done in a variety of different tools, whatever you have at your disposal. Some of the examples use Splunk because that's just what we have available to us and we're good at. Um, but, uh, so we're, not, we're, not, we're definitely not here to, 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 to push Splunk. Um, but we will buy beers for anybody, you know, uh, uh, on the expense account. Um, you just have to prove that, you know, you want to buy Splunk. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's talk about um, security awareness data. So this is an idea that Ryan had, which is basically like, look, um, can we take information about our users and how they're faring in our user awareness training and maybe our phishing tests and use those results not only for the normal things you use that for but also to, uh, to enrich um, events that we're seeing in the environment and get a sort of a secondary value out of that information. Um, so we got some security awareness data. You're not supposed to be able to read that. Um, we got some security awareness data from FishMe, super good partner of Splunk's, highly recommend them. Um, they gave us some information, uh, some sample data, and if we look a little closer, it's, uh, it's got things like, um, you know, what was the user, or what was the email address of the user in the last test? Did they, did they click on the link, right? Did they enter their password? Did they submit the form, right? And when they went through this test, and ultimately, did they actually report it like they're supposed to, that, hey, I think I just got fished, and, you know, send it off to, to your email address or whatever that you have set up for that. Um, and this is great information, and obviously, after these things run, right, you can do the normal stuff that you do, right, and go, <laughs> give them a whooping, um, make them go through more training or, or what have you. Um, but you can also take that data and use it as, a, as an enrichment source. So um, this is actually some um, data from Sys Microsoft Sysmon. Um, we do a crap ton with that. I, I do in particular at, at Splunk. Um, and this is just basically saying, okay, we've got a Sysmon alert. And this is telling us that on one, some system in our environment, Microsoft Word, just launched command.exe, right? Pretty standard kind of sim use case. Um, it's very interesting, right? Because Word and Office shouldn't be launching command.exe. Um, and certainly that's bad, but we can take that data, right, from, from, the, the, uh, from the awareness training and say, hey, we can actually add another small dimension to this data and say, oh, uh, we actually saw that this user is susceptible to phishing, right? So we're seeing something that looks like phishing, and we know that this user has a history of, of clicking on, on stuff that they ought not to, um, and we can use that to help um, sort of enrich this data, like move things up higher in a priority queue or, or what have you. Um, pretty simple, um, and, and there's a sm small spoiler alert, but we'll, we're gonna get all this information to you in a very convenient way um, coming up here. So, um, so, you know, just a summary on security awareness training, right? Um, use it as, you know, use it, use it as a source. Use it um, somewhat as, you know, canary in the coal mine for your users. Let their previous behavior tell you things um, that you didn't know maybe about your, your operational security environment. Um, and, you know, education helps. Use the paddle, but, but also, you know, use that data for other things as well. So this slide was going to be a lot cooler, and I thought I was going to bring a whole bunch of new things to this audience until the world's best keynote occurred. Decoy docs, right? Not a new idea. This is something that we just had an incredibly, who else was super amped up after that, right? I've never actually had a keynote I liked, and that was phenomenal. 
And I came out and I had a whole long fun story about decoy documents and then I found out that, oh yeah, by the way, he did that in 1986 and um, <coughs> it was in a shower with a woman where mine was at an office with a beer. So <laughs> once again, I lose. So anywho, this is a very long convoluted way just to get my love of Battlestar Galactica on screen. So once again, the idea of decoy documents is not original. There is a method of doing it called embedded callbacks or web bugs for those of you who are, who are keyboard jockeys back in the 2000 era timeframe. And it's still actually usable and workable today. It's literally just injecting HTML into a document that says, hey, when you load up one, one X one pixel, call back to go find what's going on, right? And that's all it takes. I've given two examples of HTML here that you could inject into a Word document. And I say inject like maliciously, but it literally it's just, go up into the toolbar for Microsoft Word and put input and it will put in this document. Open it up and it's gonna make HTML calls out to uh, these web servers. Now in this case, it's an open source project hosted on SourceForge, so you know it's recent, um, <laughs> of a web bug server and it'll actually recall back. I do wanna give a slight note of legality here. Uh, if you do any of these methods for a callback, which is kind of an active technique, make sure that A, it's legal in your environment, and B, I highly recommend not going into anything that's doing profiling on a host machine, otherwise you might end up with the FBI and not in the fun cliff way, so. <laughs> the second method is more of a passive, um, and the idea here is you're just gonna set up enhanced auditing of our object access on a Word document or a directory. Now, I would love for every single one of you to go out and turn on object access data on every single one of your documents, because Papa needs a new Ferrari at Splunk, right? <laughs> it makes a lot of logs. But let's be honest, you don't need to do all that. Just turn it on for a couple key things that you're looking at. These are similar to what Dave just said, canaries in the coal mine, right? But I want you to be very careful to make sure that if you do this, make sure you set up whitelists, right? You don't want your Veritas or your backup exec triggering every week. Just set this up, run it for a day or two or a week, see what's hitting, and then slowly but surely make sure the next time this happens, is some sort of crazy bear panda in your network that you're looking for. So, in summary, these are really cool, they're really fun. You can even do a little bit more excitement here and put in honey users into your network, in your document, and have them recorded, right? There's fake users, fake passwords that you could have in these documents, and as the adversary is moving laterally and finding this information, you're gonna be actually tracking them via the patterns that they're using for what they're finding. Ah, uh, yes. So when we uh, submitted the slides, we were told, oh man, not another presentation with Hitler slides in them. Um, <laughs> so we were all in the same wavelength. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about passive DNS. So a lot of you probably use passive DNS, I imagine. Yeah, everybody, probably, lots of you. Um, typically, the way you utilize passive DNS, especially for a crowd like this, is you're, you're buying that from a service and you're getting a macro view of, of, of what the internet sees, right, or what different points around the internet see um, for, for DNS, um, you know, over, over history, right? But you can actually collect this information in your own environment as well. Um, and w actually, <laughs> so passive DNS is hard to visualize, so we put a, just a picture of Ryan's new puppy. Aww. Um, and I, I'm not sure why we did that, but... Because um, I made the presentation, that's why. That's My right. damn puppy. <laughs> um, but, you know, wh what you're doing with passive DNS, right, is, is you're, you're over time collecting the uh, IP addresses and the domain names and how they map to one another, right? So what are your users seeing? And when you buy this, like I said, from a, a, a vendor, you get the macro view. You can collect it in your own environment using things like Bro, like, you know, full packet, you know, extracting it from full packet captures. We have ways to collect it in Splunk, um, a lot of ways to do it. Um, and ultimately, th this is actually an app that was written by a colleague of ours that will collect that data and do that mapping for you, right? So then you can go back in history and look, hey, uh, what was this IP addressing, or what was this IP address resolving to, um, you know, a year ago, right? Or what was this domain, you know, resolving to a year ago? Or what, where else did we see this IP address or this domain in our own environment? Um, you can actually do this, um, mostly for free, like if you did this in Splunk, you'd pay a little bit for the, you know, uh, you know, ingesting the data or whatever, but the, the bits as far as analyzing it are all free. Um, collection is just a matter of, of, of hardware, right, and, and a little bit of, of, of elbow grease, but, but something that's very, very easy to do, um, 
provides a ton of value to your, your threat intel analysts and gives you that, that internal view. Um, yep, so, you know, definitely, you know, kind of what I just said, <laughs> it's, it's worth doing. Um, you can find out how adversaries are pivoting right through your environment and you can use it for hunting using your own data. Cool, so Google Fooey, right? Everyone in this room probably can use some sort of Google Foo. Obviously, this has been well popularized uh, with Johnny. Um, maybe you're using it, find the local Chinese restaurants, or just go through and trying to find FOIA. Who knows? But I want to talk to you about a slightly different method that I've personally had a lot of success with in my career. Every organization has a lot of different vendors, a lot of different hardware, a lot of different software seats, and all these things. And every single one of us who's a vendor or creates an appliance or creates an open source project has vulnerabilities. They have compromises. They have all these sorts of things, right? And there's no damn way to keep up with them all. You, a lot of times you find out when it's on CNN and it's been out for a week. Or you're finding out three months later when your patching team says, oh yeah, we finally patched that crit one vulnerability. So how do you keep up? Google Alerts. It's super simple, really effective. I want to go over this real fast. You in a, if you're working at a security operations center or in a fusion cell or something like that, you're probably not on the, the pointy edge of the spear for emails coming in about your recent Cisco vulnerability or Splunk vulnerability. You do need to know this though. If you're in threat intel, as I learned this week, maybe you're building out a threat model where you need to know where your vulnerable assets are. If you're in a security operations center, you need to find out why did I suddenly get a huge increase in attacks on this port or this web page that's coming in. Using Google Alerts, you can set up these very specific searches about your infrastructure and your critical assets and how they affect you. So in this case, if you've never done it before, super fast, google.com slash alerts, and you just put in, now this is completely imaginary situation because we never have exploits or vulnerabilities for our software. <laughs> um, site colon www.splunk.com exploit. I could get more specific. I could say, hey, this is where we publish all these documents. Maybe you want to put this on HackDB. Maybe you want to go on to whatever your favorite hacker forum is and do a little bit more digging there. But you set this up real fast. And what you'll notice is I have a setup where how often as it happens. So as Google indexes these new logs, you're actually getting updated with it. And you could either send emails or what I think is a much more 20th century method, RSS feeds. I love RSS, it kind of went away. But you can do a lot of great things with this. And maybe you have that 60-inch monitor in your soft that you never actually found any use for other than C-SPAN. Or Norse map. We don't like to talk about that. <laughs> pew, pew. You could actually put in an RSS feeder. Maybe you have that there. Or if you want to join the 21st century, take that RSS feed and ingest it into your analytical tools or your SIM or your whatever it be. I highly recommend auditing or automating it. It is XML structured data, so this is super easy to parse with a variety of different methods, right? Get out there, be proactive. Find out what's happening on your network before you're waiting for Bob and Patch Tuesday to come back to you three weeks later and make your own decisions. All right, uh, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about LinkedIn. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting one. Um, so. LinkedIn actually is a super amazing source for understanding your own organization and understanding what adversaries know about your organization. Um, and we really wanted to include it in this talk, um, so we started kind of digging in on it. And what we learned was that uh, at least, um, at least for, for folks that are new to it, maybe don't know all the secrets, it's extraordinarily hard to get API access to LinkedIn to pull the kind of data that we wanted to. Um, we tried and failed, actually, but we came up with a way to, to kind of do it um, in an ad hoc way anyway, which we'll share with you right now. Um, so super simple, right? We, we, created, a, um, we created a new um, LinkedIn persona, right? Just some person um, not affiliated with me, brand new email address, brand new everything, right? Um, and we log in and we just search for Splunk, right? And, and it comes back and it shows a few things. It's like, hey, here's some... some um, like job titles, but doesn't show name, doesn't show location, doesn't show the valuable stuff. But if you actually just associate that user with LinkedIn, or excuse me, with Splunk, right? You say, oh yeah, I work at Splunk, and which you can just do. Um, and then if you can trick a couple of people, like say me and Ryan, into linking in with that um, 
with, with, with that new persona, all of a sudden you see like a crap ton of stuff, right? You see all kinds of information like, you know, a, some, you know the, the user's name, the, um, uh, you know, where they're located. Um, and in this case, super, like, that's when I realized how much, um, you know, LinkedIn is doing like geolocation stuff because this list that showed up after, just after linking in with me and Ryan, all of a sudden it shows James, it shows Steve. Steve's the guy that wrote the passive DNS app we showed earlier. Um, these are not only security guys that we work with every single day, but they're guys that live in Denver, which is where I was sitting um, when, when we did this. So you can actually get that, um, you can get a ton of information very, very quickly um, by, by just um, creating a persona like this, but you still have the problem of like, yeah, it's all in LinkedIn and, and we wanna pull it out and use it in, our, in whatever, you know, whatever tool we have, right? Um, and we couldn't get API access. Um, and, and actually, we were talking last night with some of the, the threat intel providers that do this every day, and they're like, yeah, it's hard. Um, and they have their ways of doing it, but um, we really were talking to one of your guys, talking about how difficult it was. Um, but we're like, hey, we gotta, we gotta do this talk, and we wanna include LinkedIn. So <laughs> we figured out a, an interesting way to do this. So you guys know Recon NG? Yeah. So Recon NG, great hacker tool, um, great for reconnaissance if you've ever done pen testing or whatever, um, great to, to learn about organizations. There's actually a, this is, gotta, just hang with me here, but there's a, there's a, there's a plug-in for Recon NG that's not actually in Recon NG, it's a pull request into that project. Um, but what it allows you to do is actually do screen scraping on LinkedIn. So you can actually um, pull that down, I think there's one or two little Python things that we, we tweak just a smidge, and then um, we're able to do screen scraping and pull all that rich data that we were just looking at from that, from that new fake account, um, pull it down, and, and the, the results at the bottom there are showing, yeah, that, that's actually you know, coming um, across from LinkedIn. So you know, this gives you a, a, a ton of opportunity, right, to, to figure out you know, who's joining my organization on LinkedIn, are they actual employees? Um, you know, it, Ultimately, if you develop this a little bit more, you'd be able to do analysis like, hey, when, when an email comes in, um, is, is that from somebody who just connected with 10, 10 of our employees on, on, on LinkedIn, right? Um, starting to statistically look for, hey, did th is this something that um, looks maybe like a, some sort of a adversary actually trying to, to um, you know, get our, get our users to, to click on something or, or open the email? So. Um, We'll go on to the next one here. So, incredibly hard to find World War II propaganda photos with the word squatting. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> um, however, I did find these lovely squatting Japanese men on the battleship Yamamoto. So I still think I get points, Rick. A couple, two maybe. Um, so domain squatting. This is also not new. This has been around as long as people have had domains, right? And the idea is to mimic a legitimate domain. Most recent case being uh, poor Mr. Uh, Podesta receiving an email that looked beautifully formatted with Google, looks like a login. When you actually dig into the domain, it's uh, this very exciting account, myaccount.google.com, cool, everything's fine. Wait, there's more. Hyphen security setting page .tk, right? Obviously illegitimate, uh, but at first glance, a lot of users aren't gonna see past so what looks like a pretty, pretty reasonable thing when you look at everything else and realize that's all kind of stuff that you might see on a URL. I like to use the tool DNS Twist. I don't think enough people are talking about this. I had a little bit of bump recently. Uh, I think this is one of the single coolest things that people can do that literally takes like five minutes of effort and you will get benefit. Uh, they call it a domain name permutation engine to detect like six or seven different methods. Everything typo squatting, the bit squatting, or bit, bit squitting, I don't know what that is. Bit squatting. Um, changing words and letters in an email or in a domain, right? And so what you do, and I picked on SANS instead of Splunk for once, you run this command, I'm gonna go over this briefly to give you an idea, but it's gonna do replacement of the word sans.org or splunk.com or cnn.com, and it's gonna find dozens if not hundreds of different domains that are very similar to this. Then it's gonna do the grunt work for you and actually go out and see if that domain has been registered. How recently has it been registered? Is there an MX record associated with it, right? Hugely valuable stuff. And then it's gonna pull it all and kick it into a CSV, which is awesome, because I hear lately that Excel is the single best tool ever made for an analyst. <laughs> I would like to argue, once again, we'll have beers, just saying. You can add more to this, right? It's not just 
these permutations, you can also add your own threat list, right? The amount of times I've seen spear phishing emails come in with www.companyname.com, massive number, right? These are just examples that I've used and other people have. I've also added in things like, I'll pick on Albania, they're probably not in the room, but a lot of times you'll see things, legitimate name, domain hyphen albania.com, right? And these are actually like legitimate domains sometimes. People stand things up for their regional presence with that. Also very easy for an adversary. So you can create your own custom dictionary and then have the DNS twist tool actually use that as well. This is the output. And I want you to think past just looking at this alerting. This is a threat intelligence course. Also look at the ability to, or not course, talk. Look at the ability to add risk, right? Look at the ability to increase your posture of who is being targeted and how and what. Just because you have all these different domains doesn't mean they'll ever be used. But you should probably look at these in the future. But once it has a DNS address or IP address associated with that domain name, that's a plus one, right? You want to look a little bit harder. And by golly, if I see there's an MS record associated with that IP address and domain too, now we're really starting to talk. And if the creation date is brand new and suddenly I get 15 emails to 14 people who are recently registered on my Splunk.com uh, LinkedIn profile, you're damn right I want to look at that a little bit harder. These are all higher threats that you need to be investigating and working on triaging, right? Bring that pearl up from the sewage and try to find the things that are there. <laughs> what? That was, that was some good euphemisms. Um, search backward. Don't just use this data as an alert thing for today. Also go back in time for anything new that comes up. And create variables for risk. Really look through and try to find fun stuff. And look at this. Create your hypothesis. This is occurring. Test it and then see what occurs. All right. Oh, oh, oh no, not done. <laughs> oh. Actually came through. Um, Nyan cow. Bonus round. Cool. So, um, you know, all the stuff we're showing you, obviously, just screenshots, and we didn't do demos or anything like that. But we've captured really all of these um, techniques, um, everything that we did to sort of generate those and, and, and that's actually working. Um, we captured those into a Splunk app that you can download from, from our website. Um, again, completely free, just, a, just one possible way to show these things. Um, it's out on GitHub, uh, it's out on Splunk Base, use the GitHub one, um, and at least for the next 10 to 15 minutes, it needs an update on, on Splunk Base. Um, but but this will allow you to download that app, download the free version of Splunk, a free app. There's sample data in there for kind of all the techniques we just used. You can kind of see see how that works in, in your environment, use it as a, a jumping off point. And with that, oh yes. So, you know, hopefully, you know, we're just giving you, you all some ideas about ways that you can just, you know, be creative, right? Think about the data that you have in your environment. Take a tool, simple tool like, uh, you know, simple tool like Splunk or, or like anything else, right? And, and, you know, even Excel, to Ryan's point, um, and start leveraging um, the data that you already have in your environment. There's many, many other examples we didn't talk about today, like um, trouble ticketing system, incident response systems, uh, you name it. Um, so so there's, there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity there to, to get more value out of what's already going on in your environment. And the one piece of advice that Scott gave his mentor was you have to have a Sun Tzu quote. Um, so instead, we found out uh, in the 26th century, there's actually Sun Cyber Zoo. So much better guy. You check out his Twitter account. <laughs> the idea here, once again, if you take anything away from this, and I really hope you do, is look local. Stay home. See what you have first. Definitely get threat intelligence from expert vendors. But first, pull from your own resources and see what you have. Tip O'Neill used to say, all cyber intelligence is local. Um, and then he would say something about politics, and Reagan would laugh, and they'd go have a lot of scotch. <laughs> but the important thing is, stay home. Look in your own house. You're leaving stuff on the table. Get it, right? So takeaways. Dig into your own data. If you're not looking at LinkedIn, you're failing. And I'm going to call that right now. LinkedIn is a huge source of adversary data. They're using it against you. Why aren't you at least figuring out how they're using it against you? DNS twist is literally like three minutes to compile, get up and going, and you're going to get results. 
I like automation. Um, I was actually really inspired many years ago by a presentation that Scott Roberts got, gave on uh, using robots to fight the bad guys. It's a phenomenal presentation, and this falls in that. Automate everything you can, that way you can lay off your tier one and get cooler threat intelligence from other vendors, <laughs> right? <laughs> Local passive DNS is awesome. You're gonna see a lot of stuff on your network that you're never gonna be able to see otherwise, and you'll be able to then dig in and find compromised hosts. And if you're getting security awareness training data, that is phenomenal stuff. You're paying for it already, get double dipping in that. You've already got the data, now you have this huge new data source to go back into and find out which users are most likely to click on stuff. And then decoys, we heard Cliff's thing. That was an incredible story. Decoy documents is a really cool example. Uh, it's hard to actually find people who have done it successfully, so if you have any use cases or actual experiences of doing this and seeing results, I'd love to hear them. Uh, but the most famous is, oh, I don't know, the cuckoo's egg.